Good morning and welcome to Church at Home at Life Christian Fellowship. LCF family and friends, welcome. If this is your first time here with us and you're a guest, uh, so glad you joined us this morning for a Church at Home experience. Uh, I'm George Voles. I'm youth pastor here. And uh, I've got some information I just love to share with you. So get ready to mark your calendars. Today, in fact, we have an vi annual vision meeting. Um, and uh, you should have received the link for the Zoom meeting. And that will run from 11 to 12 today. So be prepared for that and uh, jump on board. We'd love to see you in that meeting. And then next, next week, guys, is Mother's Day. And we just got a, an awesome opportunity to celebrate moms. So send in your pictures. Um, you can submit them to katialcfconnect.com. And uh, send in pictures of mom and the, and the ladies of our church and, um, and our communities. And, and you'll be entered in for a raffle uh, next week for Mother's Day. So I trust that you do that. Get those in by Friday at noon so Katie can get everyone uh, accounted for. And then uh, there's ways to stay connected throughout the week, guys. If you have any information that you have need of, whether it's life groups that meet, the youth that meet, we still meet on Zoom. Um, kids ministries. The ministries are still going on, guys, so all the information is there. If you have any general questions uh, or, 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 or you need info concerning Life Christian Fellowship, you can always go to info at lcfconnect.com. And uh, there's also a giving platform on our website, so those of you that continue, continue to give, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we certainly appreciate it so that we can remain well-resourced here as a church. And... Um, Enjoy the message, guys. Uh, at this time, I, I just want to say, can't wait to, to we can gather together physically. Um, it's going to be a, a, an amazing reunion. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to that. But uh, in the meantime, let's enjoy this message. And we have some worship coming up in just a few moments. A nice backyard fire pit worship with Garrett and Grant Novak. So be safe, be well, and be courageous. Blessings, guys. Cries to roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to seal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't. Stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love She no longer has a place to hide Captive to the last. No, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Whoa. There's power that can break off every chain. Oh, there's power that can empty out a grave. Resurrection power that can save is power in your name, power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. Oh God, there's power that can empty out a grave. Yeah, there's resurrection power that can save. Stand the 
chance when I'm standing your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love My fear, it doesn't stand a chance when I'm Stand the chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love My fear, it doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love Whoa. When I'm standing on the rock
Hey, welcome. It's another week of Church at Home. I think this is week eight for us, but who's counting? Anyway, we're really glad that you've chosen to be with us here at Life Christian Fellowship. Um, We call it Sunday Celebration. We've got so much to be grateful for. I don't know if you have caught, we've been posting some uh, daily devotionals Monday through Friday over these past couple of weeks, and uh, we hope you log in for uh, the upcoming week. It's just a daily shot of encouragement for us. When we head to the scriptures and um, and just get a spiritual pick me up, but uh, we're continuing in a series that then live like this. It really flows out of Romans, uh, the first eleven chapters, talk about the incredible mercy of God, and that our response is we're to offer our, ourselves to to God, our bodies as living sacrifices, fully surrendered into God's hands, uh, willing to do whatever He uh, calls us to do. So we've been heading through the scriptures. We're in Romans chapter 12. We're going to skip over uh, three important verses that actually next uh, Sunday, it's Mother's Day. We're going to focus in on verses 14 through 16. But just join me here as we read some really challenging verses. Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Now, in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is really echoing the words of Jesus. This isn't new to us. Those who are followers of Jesus, Jesus has made it very clear. There's a way that we live out our lives. We love God with everything that we've got, and we love our neighbor as ourself. And we're not selective. In fact, the neighbor is anyone who is in need, anyone really around us, within our reach. And so, uh, as a result, Jesus has even said that we need to, uh, instead of uh, being retaliatory toward enemies, uh, we're to actually do good toward them and we're to love our enemies. And that's what the Apostle Paul is teaching here. So, he's bringing some real clarity to those who have presented themselves, uh, their bodies, and the totality of who they are, Uh, to Jesus as living sacrifices. He brings clarity with good and evil. And by the way, God makes it really clear in his word about what good is and what evil is. And yes, both of them are real. And in this uh, clarity with what is good and what is evil, uh, the Apostle Paul lays out that in civil and criminal uh, injustice situations, that retaliation is never to be our responsibility. We do not take matters into our own hands, but instead we leave it in the hands of God. But there are authorities that God has placed uh, in our world, within our community, within our culture, that actually have the responsibility of carrying out justice on our behalf. And we're to trust God and the God-given authorities. And I really encourage you that you can head on into Romans chapter 13, We'll hit those issues in the future, but uh, God lays out we need to be subject uh, to the authorities. They've been planted there, and actually they've been planted there by God for our good. But it's very clear here um, that uh, we as believers are not to be the ones who retaliate for ourselves, but uh, we're to leave that in the hands of God. So here comes the question. How are Christians to relate and respond to evil when it is done to them? And by the way, this is a really big question because the, the words that come from Paul and the instructions that come from Jesus is so challenging for every single one of us because the old nature uh, that is lived in an old way of thinking, we come and either withdraw or else we get engaged, but it's to get even 
And so retaliation is really kind of the, the human way of fighting back. Um, do not repay anyone, anyone evil for evil. And uh, the next sentence, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Um, by the way, Paul is laying out the parameters for Christians who are wronged, and he really offers no wiggle room whatsoever. Okay, so catch what he says. Do not repay anyone, anyone, evil for evil. You can't just be selective on, um, on, on who you will treat with kindness, but do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So uh, it's, it's look around you. There are individuals that are watching your life. The world watches our lives. And for us to stand for Christ, uh, we need to be careful that we maintain the reputation of love for God, but also love for people. And then Paul says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, and I am thankful for that phrase, as far as it depends on you. There's an acknowledgement here that some people it's impossible almost to stay at peace with, but as far as it depends on us, we are peacemakers. We live at peace and we do it with everyone. So there's a reason that I underline those three words, anyone, everyone, and everyone. Paul is not giving us wiggle room. He's not allowing us to be selective in how we respond and who we respond toward. And remember this, that Paul is addressing Christians that are in the city of Rome. Rome is a powerful city, but Rome is not friendly toward those who are Jesus followers, not in this time. Uh, it was Esther and my privilege to, uh, for our 40th anniversary, uh, we headed over to Italy and uh, we spent several days in Rome. So uh, we started taking selfies, which we just don't do, but uh, it's kind of like, yes, we're here in these places. But when we went, came to the Colosseum at Rome, Esther just responded and says, I can't do a selfie here by the Colosseum. She says, all those other th places where we have taken uh, selfies, whether it's Leaning Tower of Pisa, whether it's uh, some of the beauty of Venice, um, uh, whether it's over in Florence, uh, that was awesome. And selfies, no problem whatsoever. And even when we went through the Vatican, that wasn't a big deal. So it's like, you take the selfie, you smile. But she just said, uh, I guess I'll take a selfie with you, but we can't smile on this one. And so sure enough, we tried to do some sober faces. But the reason that she said that was, she says, I just feel like this is sacred ground for us. For you see those individuals who are in the Church of Rome, they were in uh, very difficult circumstances. In fact, much of Roman culture and the people of Rome turned against Christians. Christians were rounded up. It's in the Colosseum that it literally became a slaughterhouse for many of those who profess Christianity in those early years. This is just the way it was. And by the way, it challenges uh, us um, what's inside of us every single time when we think about these Christians, yes, in Rome, but also for the Christians across the world that are especially going through deep persecution. And Jesus warned us, there will be times where you will be misunderstood and you will be persecuted because you follow me. When we walk in light, when we live as living sacrifices, there are others that aren't going to agree with what this means to follow after Jesus. And in fact, the closer that you follow Jesus, in many ways, it becomes a very, very lonely walk. Now, catch what Paul says, verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. By the way, there's the story of Irenaeus. He was one of the early church fathers, and he would have been in Rome. And uh, sure enough, he was taken and thrown to the lions there in the Colosseum. But as he's doing that, he had a real sense. And in fact, what he spoke was that he surrendered himself into the just hands of God. And so his martyrdom actually was, uh, was something that he came and embraced because he knew that God was just, and he knew that God would vindicate him. So he trusted God and left room for God's wrath. Uh, it is mine to avenge, God says, I will repay, says the Lord. So when we sit back and say vengeance belongs to, and the answer is vengeance ultimately belongs to God because he's the one who will judge all. And he's the one who can protect us through the trials. But even if he doesn't, uh, it's God who will sweep us away to heaven. It's God who will carry us through the difficult points in life. We can absolutely trust God uh, for this. Uh, then catch verse 20. 
On the contrary, Paul writes, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, I think it is uh, the best often that we find in our willpower is maybe to not retaliate. But Paul says that's not exactly the way of following after Jesus and living out this life of living sacrifices. But what he says is this. Don't just repay evil for evil, but instead, the very enemy that does evil towards you, if he is hungry, then you feed him. If he is thirsty, then you give him something to drink. So the idea is, you can't just say, well, I I, I won't pay him back uh, with evil, but I'm going to withdraw and somehow withhold myself and keep my distance And in fact, what Paul says is this, no, that's not appropriate, but instead we need to respond with goodness and it needs to be very practical. By the way, the kind of words uh, that are used here when we're to repay evil with good um, and kindness, the word that's used there is not just talking about an intrinsic goodness where Uh, Sometimes people will just do the right thing. Um, This is more than that. This is very purposeful. In fact, it's very practical. It's demonstrated in the practical way of lives. Remember this. Pressure is mounting in Rome for these Christians. The reality of evil being done to them is real. Within a short period of time, many of them will be thrown to the lions. And while this is taking place... Paul is saying, I want you to make sure that you are doing that which is not simply intrinsically good to you, but that you are living in such a way that it is attractional to those outside of the family of God, those who are not believers in Jesus. He wants it to be very practical. And by the way, for us to live like this, to do good when someone has done evil toward us, that is not by uh, just man's nature. That is by the Spirit's nature. We really have to think about that. So not only is it practical, but it's principled. When I speak of principled, it means we are functioning by principle, and that requires deep thought and uh, spiritually connecting with God, walking in the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit comes and arises in our life, and it's love, joy, peace. We can accomplish this, but it's only because of the transforming power of the Spirit. But also, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, earlier when we looked at, it's living out the Christian life with a transformed mind. We think differently about the notion of how to respond to those who do evil. And in fact, in many ways, what we do is we predispose ourselves where we are prepared uh, to move with kindness toward those who do evil toward us because we have deeply thought about it. We have prayed about it. And um, it's natural for people to respond with retribution to those who oppose them. But when the supernatural power of God comes in and the clarity of the instruction of the Bible becomes the foundation for our life, then this call to establish our response with principled conduct is completely possible. And Paul calls us to do that. We need to do what Peter said in chapter 1. Uh, of his first epistle, prepare your minds for action. And that's what we need to do. And not only that, but in addition to that, this is something that needs to be done publicly. Hey, let me just look at this quick phrase with you. Uh, You will heap burning coals on his head. You can read different um, Bible scholars, um, uh, theologians. You'll find individuals with different discussion points on this. Most likely what I believe that the Apostle Paul is talking about is uh, that he's speaking about that when we respond with goodness and kindness uh, toward those who've done evil toward us, it puts them in such a situation that that there is a, a burn that begins to take place in their very way of thinking. Um, many believe that this, this kind of thing has to do like with a crucible that, that there is a, a burning up of, and they're trying to figure out what is taking place. And uh, they're asking this question of, this is very, very unusual. What is happening here? By the way, from uh, Victor Hugo's book, Les Miserables, you will find uh, the story of uh, Jean Valjean. But he encounters a bishop 
And as he encounters the bishop after he has spent 19 years in prison, for uh, which was an extreme sentence for something that was as simple as uh, stealing some bread to, to, to feed those he loved. And when he came to the bishop's house, the bishop went ahead and welcomed him in, fed him. And in the night before uh, Jean Valjean is heading out, he gathers up the silver in the bishop's home, steals it, runs off and flees. There are magistrates that find him. There are the police force that arrest him and they pull him back to the bishop's home. And as he faces the bishop, the bishop tells the authorities that uh, all of this silver that he has gathered up and stolen from him, that uh, he had freely given it uh, to Jean Valjean. And in fact, he goes and grabs and says, you forgot though the candlesticks. And the silver candlesticks from his table. He hands it to him and tells the police to go ahead and let him go as a free man. And it so troubles Jean Valjean that there really is a moment that you will find him, at least in the movie, you will find him uh, in the chapel. And there he is with the cross in the background. And as he's there in the chapel, he is troubled for he knows he does not deserve this kindness and forgiveness. I believe that's a little bit of the idea where the Apostle Paul says, uh, when you do kindness and good toward those who have harmed you, uh, it will be a burn of like heaping coals upon them, but it will trouble them and perhaps lead them back in toward the mercy of God. Verse 21, do not overcome, be overcome by evil. Don't let it conquer you, but overcome evil and overcome evil with good. I don't know if you caught the movie, but uh, it flows out of an incredible book by Lauren Hildebrand. Um, I love the stories that she writes about and they're stories from history. Uh, The man's name is Louis Zamperini. And uh, Louis was uh, in World War II, was a soldier and has, has, has quite a story. He was an athlete. And in fact, he uh, went on to compete in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Germany. But when World War II broke out, uh, he became, uh, he he headed into the military and he served with a B-24 bomber. Um, They were shot down in the Pacific Ocean. Most died in the crash. But Zamperini uh, and another airman survived for a total of 47 days adrift in the ocean on a life raft. When he did survive that crash and ultimately uh, survived uh, the time at sea, he ends up being captured and uh, held as a prisoner in a Japanese POW camp. And uh, this, this book, Unbroken, tells his story and the horrors of war. But there was one specific, um, there was one, uh, specific captain uh, in, in the Japanese forces who absoluted, uh, absolutely hated Lewis. And uh, the nickname for this man was the bird, but he did horrible things to him, brutal things to him. And in fact, when uh, Zamperini ended up, yes, surviving the POW camp and ended up coming back home, uh, he drifted toward uh, alcoholism. He had nightmares at night because of the, hor- uh, the atrocities of war and the pain that he went through. But in uh, 1949, he grudgingly attended a Billy Graham crusade in Los Angeles. In fact, this was really the emerging of Billy Graham as a, um, as a renowned evangelist. And, and this was the large crusades there. Uh, and the second night of the Los Angeles Billy Graham crusade, uh, Louis Zamperini came and he gave his life to Christ in 1949 at the Billy Graham crusade. And he became a very devoted follower of Christ. But one of the things that God had to deal with his heart had to do with forgiveness toward uh, the, the Japanese soldiers uh, who uh, held him prisoner. And especially this one that was nicknamed the bird. Um, In 1952, during a speaking tour in Tokyo, Japan, Lewis had the opportunity to meet with prisoners at Sagamo Prison, which was filled with 850 Japanese war criminals. Some of those were the very captors and those who tortured him. One was a former Japanese soldier 
who wondered why he would come and share his testimony, but also preach the good news of Jesus Christ to them. He did not understand how someone would, could forgive all of these fellow soldiers who had treated him so badly. Um, it was Louis, Louis, who told his story and said that the greatest story of forgiveness that the world has ever known was the cross. When Christ was crucified, he said, Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. And uh, Zamperini told him, It is only through the cross that I can come back here and say this, but I do forgive you. And then he responded and opened up an invitation for individuals, and it was uh, this uh, Japanese soldier, uh, Mr. Sasaki, who responded and uh, received Jesus Christ as his Savior. Later on in 1998, uh, he discovered that this, uh, what, uh, Mutsuhiro Watanabe, nicknamed the bird, he was still alive. He couldn't find him. In fact, uh, when he did, he did locate him, but he refused to meet with him, but he wrote him this letter. As a result of my prisoner war experience, under my unwarranted and unreasonable punishment, my post-war life became a nightmare. It was not so much due to the pain and suffering as it was to the tension of stress and humiliation that caused me to hate with a vengeance. Under your discipline, my rights, not only as a prisoner of war, but also as a human being, were stripped from me. It was a struggle to maintain enough dignity and hope to live until the war's end. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble, but thanks to a confrontation with God, through the evangelist Billy Graham, I committed my life to Jesus. Love has replaced the hatred that I had for you. Christ said, forgive your enemies and pray for them. As you probably know, I returned to Japan in 1952 and was graciously allowed to address all the Japanese war criminals at Sogamo Prison. I asked then about you and was told that you probably had committed harikari, which I was sad to hear. At that moment, like the others, I also forgave you and now would hope that you would also become a Christian. I will tell you this. This kind of a radical forgiveness is only possible because of the overwhelming sense of Christ's love and his forgiveness for us. And so the Apostle Paul speaks to, yes, the people at Rome, that he speaks to every single one of us. And while you're watching this right now, I know that this is a hard call for you. It's a hard call for me. But God calls us to love people. And it's not just the individuals that love us. It's every single individual, even those who would persecute us, even those who would be our enemies. And God calls us to actively engage with the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to reach out in love toward others. And they may persecute you, but you bless them. You do not curse them. They may cause you harm and evil, but instead you turn toward kindness toward them. And if they are hungry, you feed them. If they're thirsty, you give them something to drink. Overcome evil, and you overcome evil with good. Let's pray, shall we? Dear God, you ask us to do some things that it's impossible apart from your love. And we ask of you, God, that you would teach us how to live like Jesus lived, to live the transformed life, to live the surrendered life. And so we invite you and welcome you. Father, for whoever might have just listened to this message and maybe have never responded and really asked for your personal forgiveness, maybe they have never seen the extreme uh, depth of love that you've had for them. But I pray now in the name of Jesus that they would respond towards you, open their heart and ask, uh, forgive us, uh, forgive me, Lord. I have trespassed, I have sinned against you. But forgive me of my sins, my debts, my trespasses, even as I forgive those who sin against me. Teach us how to love those, God, who would be unkind and persecute us. Um, and so we give ourselves to you, O Lord, one more time as living sacrifices. With your help, O God, we can live the life of overcoming love. So bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Hey, it's been great to have you with us here for uh, Church at Home. God bless you. Um, uh, stay close to Jesus. Walk with him. Pick up the scriptures. 
and uh, put it into practice. He'll help you live it out. God bless. Have an awesome week.